Hello, everyone. I was recently a guest on Alex Securis' Skeptical podcast. We had a wide-ranging conversation, I think covering everything I've ever podcasted on, from geopolitics and 9-11 to spiritual awakening, counterfeit spiritual experiences, cults, near-death experience, and even touching on alien encounters, my favorite. So I won't uh, say any more than that, or, or only that. Skeptico is the outstanding podcast on the internet for many of those themes, and I will link to it below and you can check out Alex's in excess of 400 interviews he's been doing over the past 10 years now. And on that note, we'll jump in. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and I'm really excited about today's show because I'm not just a podcaster, and I've been a podcaster for a long time, but I got into podcasting because I was a listener, and I still am a podcast listener today, and I love to share the work of people who really inspire me. And there's a guy who has really been knocking it out of the park lately. You might have seen him on the show before. His name is Richard Cox, but he has a show, the Deep State Consciousness Podcast. So Richard, thanks so much for joining me and welcome to Skeptico. Welcome back. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Nice to be back. So let's see. Of course, you are being roped into playing Skeptico Jeopardy. You knew that coming in, so there's kind of no, no secrets in any of that. I, yeah, but I'm the board is more high tech than last time I was on. This is really because I listened to the show. I hadn't seen this. This is like really yeah. like on the game show now. Yeah, yeah, great. yeah. You're right. We're taking it to the next level. Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to read the Skeptico Jeopardy board for those who are just listening along. It starts out with deep states, 9-11, podcasting, cult-ish, trauma, medium, non-duality, suicide, and ET. Now, you have not been given a heads up on any of these topics. No. So we're going to get the raw, unedited version of Richard Cox. I'm going to pick the first one because I think it's only appropriate since I did just a little bit of an introduction. You tell us more about the podcast. Okay, well, I never intended to do a podcast. I fell into it because I was doing some work with uh, Tim Freak, a philosopher, a previous guest on the show, republishing some of his books. And I felt like uh, Tim goes through so many different things. There's a lot of subjects he covered in the past, like Zen and gurus that I've written books on perhaps, but there was nothing on YouTube. And I thought, hey, someone should interview him about this. And no, no one was. So I thought I'd, I'd throw my hat in the ring and see if I could pull off an interview. And it wasn't too awful, people told me. So I sort of liked it. And then I realized that I knew all these interesting people who were just quietly living their lives. And um, I felt the world deserved to hear a bit more from them. So initially I thought I would just do one or two. And then I kept finding that I knew more and more interesting people. So that's how I I kind of slipped into the whole podcast thing. Maybe we'll just leave it at that because I think we'll we'll get into that as I let you pick the next topic that we might go to. I'm going to run roughshod over all these boundaries. You have to watch me there, um, Alex. I mean, just I could I could follow up on what you're saying there with the the nine eleven and spirituality thing, or the conspiracy and spirituality, if, if that's Please do. You want to go there? Yeah. I think that's um, in part a product of my age that I'm 36 now, which means I was 18 when 9-11 happened. And that coincided with me leaving school. And it was also a time in my, my life where um, I suppose, yeah, to pick a tarot card, the tower tarot card would be the appropriate one where my belief in the society as it is, structures as they are, the system, the establishment, that was all coming tumbling down. And I didn't really have anything to replace it with. And it was leading to a rather despairful place of, does anyone have a clue what's what's going on here? Um, things like your President George W. Bush being elected, that shot to pieces my faith in the, um, the concept of a leader of the free world for reasons I don't think I need to explain. Um, and then in, no, in no, stepping... No, no, I think, uh, let me take that back. I think you do need to explain for a couple of reasons. One, my audience is largely American. You're British, 
you're in particular you're on the Isle of Man, which is even more kind of interested and kind of isolated in a way. But you know, what was your what why do you say that? Because I go I go a million different directions with that. I go uh skull and bones, CIA, mm. uh well, yeah, family nothing of... that deep initially. Nothing that deep initially for me. So um you so you have to understand that um up until about the age of 16, 17, I believed in the system, right? As, as everyone does, really. Um, so I remember being a little kid and we had to make a model house and I made the White House because I heard like about George Bush Sr. being um, the president and he'd done something to protect golden eagles and I thought that sounded great and presidents protect golden eagles and they're the leaders of the free world. And I felt everything was figured out and we have the scientific theories we have um, for very well thought, thought out reasons, okay? And even if random mutations in evolutionary biology might not make sense to me, it certainly makes sense to the boffins at Oxford University, okay? And that they've, my, if I could get, like, talk to people like that, my questions would be answered. And even if economic systems maybe don't appear quite right sometimes, of course, that we all have the, the economic policies we have because they are the best ones. And you know, it couldn't be any other way. Um, so... One of many things, another thing would be my just direct experience of going to the educational system, but with the with the Bush thing, initially I was struck by just the, what seemed to me like the most incredible coincidence of, in a country of 300 million people, the son <laughs> of the guy who did the job one before getting it in. It's like, gosh, is there some is there some fundamental reversion to monarchy that human societies just go through? Are we sort of that primitive that we just revert back to what seems like a less evolved form of government? And then I thought, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe sometimes like the, uh, the children of great athletes are themselves great athletes for genetic reasons. So maybe the Bush family are just the best of the bunch. And George Jr., you know, he really is the brightest America has to offer. Literally, I thought this prior to seeing him on TV, and then I did. And it became apparent to me that um, the United States did have better to offer, um, you know, in terms of intellectual capacity. And there's just something very wrong with this picture. This, the, the picture no longer makes sense, you know. So that was one of, of many cracks that were appearing at that time. So roll that then, I, I kind of sidetracked the story a little bit. We have to roll that into 9-11. And, and I guess in particular, if I was going to hone in, because you've done so much work on it that we could spend an hour just talking about that. What interested me from a skeptico perspective, and this is jumping right into the middle of this story, folks, because again, Richard has done so much work on this, is a point where, where it was almost an aside, almost a throwaway point, Richard, but you go, you know, hey, look, I can look at the Building 7 collapse and understand why people see that as a smoking gun. You don't cover Building 7. You did this deep dive into the CIA, into um, all these shenanigans that are going back and forth between the CIA and the FBI, following all these guys. And then you get and you start unraveling the, the craziness of the intelligence agencies covering their ass when clearly they were following these guys, knew about this thing, and then were maneuvered by whatever force is out there to do that, to kind of look the other way and bypass this. Yeah, well, just to give some backstory of this, 9-11 has always kind of interested me because I, uh, as I say, it happened at this time of like where I was just getting into spiritual awakening. And these two things seemed utterly joined to me, like the inner world and the outer, right? That there are deep mysteries in our, in our own consciousness. And also there are deep mysteries in the world. The surface appearance that we are presented with in the nightly news is, is not true. And I think it, back then there was also at some point a recognition in me that I didn't have enough worldly knowledge and context to take on those questions. And things like the internet just weren't in the state they're in now, obviously. So I kind of, I left it for a few years and came back to it and left it again. And most recently, um, I, I kind of stumbled into meeting this chap, Adam Fitzgerald, and he's the real hardcore 9-11 researcher. So I, I've been working with him on, on the series, um, looking at the geopolitical history, okay? Because Building 7 and the collapse of the towers has become 9-11 for the conspiracy angle. It's, it's con consumed this immense amount of attention, perhaps for good reason. 
but we certainly feel that there are ways you can prove government complicity in the attacks without mentioning the demolition of buildings at all. And um, it's not that we will never touch the buildings. We actually just recorded with uh, David Chandler last night, the physicist who um, who did a lot of work on the collapse of the buildings, and um, he's the guy that forced NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, to admit a, a period of free fall in there. So we've had to step into that because it's, it's too big to ignore. But my feeling about it is people do not necessarily accept things for um, physics or statistical reasons alone. Okay, so classic example everyone knows is Dr. Semmelweis, the fellow who um, discovered that uh, surgeons who work with corpses and then go straight into the maternity ward uh, vastly increase the death rate of um, newborn babies and mothers. And even though he could demonstrate this beyond all doubt statistically, people wouldn't have it because there was no plausible mechanism for how a little bit of skin under the fingernail from a corpse could cause the, these kind of um, these kind of effects prior to germ theory. And, and you will, of course, see this with um, psychical research and things. So physics aside, I think if you're going to make those kind of claims, you need to demonstrate what kind of geopolitical context, what kind of structures in the deep state, the CIA, whoever else, could give rise to rigging a building with explosive charges. And um, so that's why we've, we've laid towards the geopolitical in a strong way. Yeah, I, 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 I hear that. And I guess, I, I hope we can turn this into something other than just kind of a rambling discussion, but it might just be a rambling discussion between two podcasters. To me, you're doing a, a lot more and you're doing a lot of deeper work in the kind of deep spiritual kind of thing that you said, because I would maybe challenge you a little bit on that idea that, oh, you know, the reason that people didn't accept that there's these unseen forces being germs and bacteria that cause women to get to die when they're infected by the surgeon. No, people just did it because they just followed authority. I mean, they were just told this is the truth and they just accepted it. Then it read the current science and then were, you know, converted by the data. And in the same way, 9-11, I mean, people, no one's going to change their mind on this. People, uh, not, not no one, I shouldn't say no one. A, a, a vast majority of people are not going to change their mind. And the government agencies uh, on a world basis, you know, we have ours here, you have yours there, and then there's something above that that we don't totally understand. They rely on the fact that most people just do what they're told. And most people are so involved in the day-to-day -day struggles of their life that they really don't have any time to look at any of this stuff. And then, so that's kind of one point that I'd make. But the other point is, we should never rely on intelligence organizations to do anything other than exactly what they did on 9-11. Absolutely, absolutely. To, just to address your first point briefly, um, I'm, I appreciate the um, pessimism is a true strong, strong word, but the pragmatism maybe that you bring to these kind of conversations and in a world of spirituality where everyone thinks that the age of Aquarius is dawning or something, or we're going to have a revolution and overthrow the deep state and uh, live in peace and happiness forever. Uh, you've always been a bit more pragmatic on that and said, no, it's, this is always going to be a niche of the population. Uh, and I, I appreciate that. So when, when I say um, trying to demonstrate a plausibility to such a thing as, as bombs in buildings, um, I don't mean so that we can finally stick it in the face of the populace and they will have to come round. and millions of people will take to the streets. I mean to allow for an understanding of that, firstly for myself, um, because I have gaps there too. I don't know who could have given the order for such a thing um, within the deep state. Um, and then to allow for people who want to know to, to come to know that. But you did. And, and the second point, yeah, I think it's, um, it's beyond doubt, both in, in September 11 itself, that the CIA were protecting at least two of the hijackers. Um, that can be demonstrated beyond all doubt. And additionally, going back to the, the 1993 uh, bombing, it's clear that they were protecting the Brooklyn cell um, that nearly brought down the Trade Center then um, as part of an historic relationship with Islamist militant types, uh, which ratcheted up seriously in the 1980s. But you can go way back with it because they're, uh, they're a convenient proxy army to uh, carry out geostrategic aims. And that's, that's what the CIA and assorted intelligence agencies do. They're not there to protect Americans from terror threats. Yeah. <laughs> And there's just so many threads to pull on. I might even, if I have the time, dig up a, a clip that you have from one of the things where you play in 
an interview from Richard Clark, who was in the White House. What was his official position in the White House? He was National Security Coordinator in the White House. So he oversaw different agencies and their relationship to the, the executive branch then. The, the, the stunning thing about, about that for me that kind of encapsulates this whole thing is Richard Clark was just really hung out to dry on this, you know, like, gosh, how did you blow this? You know, because we have to find somebody to blame. And he fought back a little bit by kind of outing some people. And in this interview, he kind of outs the CIA and the FBI in terms of the information he's getting back. And he goes right up to the verge of saying, clearly, you know, these guys lied, you know, including Mueller and from the FBI, including all these other guys. But then he backs off in typical, you know, intelligence fashion, which is all we'll ever get. And that's my, my, my bottom line on this is all we'll ever get is Richard Clark saying, well, it could be this, which is totally ridiculous, or it could be this, which is totally ridiculous, or I don't know what it is. Yeah. So Richard Clark, Clark's clip is both deeply revealing and probably not entirely true. Okay, right. or we could certainly question the narrative he's, he's putting across because um, just to give the listener the narrative, um, two of the hijackers who ultimately boarded Flight 77, which went into the Pentagon, uh, the CIA knew they came into the country and not only failed to inform the FBI, who should have taken over the case then, but deliberately absolutely blocked the FBI from ever finding out they were there, uh, whilst these guys were ferried around by Saudi intelligence with links to the royal family, um, up until the point that they boarded the planes. Um, so this is like a total crime, right? And Richard Clark's um, hypothesizes that the CIA were trying to flip these guys because they didn't have agents inside Al-Qaeda, right? And that's the bit that um, it, uh, it doesn't really make sense on, in a lot of ways, okay? When you, when you go into, and we, we've just interviewed a, an FBI agent who was involved in annexation at the time, that's the CIA's bin Laden unit, um, who is also of that opinion, who is also, and is very angry about it, about how the CIA would not let him pass this information on to his colleagues at the FBI. Um, and you know, when you talk to someone who's on the inside and they can resolve your questions sometimes and they go, oh, okay, now, now I see. Um, thus far, that's not the sense we've come away with. We've still come away feeling like, yeah, it actually makes far more sense if you look at it, but certain people in the CIA wanted these attacks to, to go ahead. I, to me, that looks like a, a more sensible picture. Yeah, or th the way I would phrase it is they had a, a, a higher instruction or mission to not intervene at some point, not that they even knew what that was about. And then after the attacks, they had another, you know, mission, and that was to not get killed, suicided, or you know, completely sent to prison for not disclosing this. So to me, it, it just kind of it is, it's very instructive, the series of interviews you did into exactly the psychology that must be going on in these people's minds. You know, I mean, they're given a job to do, they're doing the job the best they can. And at some point they go, wow, but shouldn't we be, you know, telling somebody? And then you, you put that aside and then 9-11 happens. You, what can you do? I mean, you, there's nothing you can do. You got to go along with the program now. Yeah. And it's, it's not um, speculative to say about them getting in trouble. All, all the people that blew whistles on things after 9-11 did get in serious trouble and did have FBI agents bursting into their houses and putting guns to their head. And um, some of them did do time in jail or lost their jobs or ended up in court at the very least. So uh, whereas all the people who um, participated in the pre 9-11 cover up and continued that cover up afterwards, they all got promoted. So it's entirely accurate. Yeah. You know, the thing I say is there, there's no such thing as whistleblowers anymore. If you see a whistleblower, you should be immediately suspect. And in a minute, we'll talk about ET and the TTSA to the Stars Academy and the controlled disclosure on all that. And to me, one of the first telltale signs of that whole thing is the guy claims to be a whistleblower, and he's not a whistleblower. So it's it's a controlled, fake whistle. Whistleblowers wind up in jail or dead. That's yeah. the way it is now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'm not saying there's no, you know, there are people who go through hardship, and that that would indicate, you know, through whistleblowing, and that would indicate maybe there's something 
more serious about their story. But um, yeah, that's the general path. We have to be very careful and discerning. In To me, what's really, really significant about what you're doing is you are connecting it, as we said from the very beginning, to the deep state contemplation that is the personal spiritual journey kind of thing. And I've always felt that the conspiracy stuff, the conspiracy science, if you will, the conspiracy ethos has a role to play in that. Because the folks that I encountered and I encounter over and over again, who are not willing to go there are not willing to look at that shadow, because 9-11 is a shadow, we don't know where the shadow goes. And I don't particularly care to tr spend my whole life tracing down those shadows. But I do think as part of my spiritual path, it's important to understand that there is a shadow there. We had an interesting conversation, I don't know, a year or so ago with Tim Freak, who I love Tim and he's awesome, but he's just not willing to go there on any of this stuff. I have a similar kind of relationship with my buddy, uh, Rick Archer at, at Good at the yeah. Gas Pump. Just close to this aspect, which to me seems to close them off from a, a greater part of this spiritual path that needs to be explored. Where does 9-11 fit with you and your deeply spiritual show? You know, I'm not entirely sure. It very much arises from a felt place in me that these things are connected. And maybe one day I'll conclude that they're not. And there really is no link between spirituality and events like 9-11. But my, my felt sense is um, that there is. I think, you know, if my podcast is about anything, it's about being with what is and how we perceive the world and how things aren't what they appear to be. And 9-11 is certainly something that isn't what it appears to be. So it draws me in in that way. Um, and then the question becomes, well, how deep does that rabbit hole go? Are we going all the way into, you know, Illuminati type groups and connections with all the world, the entities that are ultimately behind this How thing. are we just, not? How are we not? That's the <laughs> inevitable thing I think arises when we acknowledge, okay, you know, Dr. Julie Beichel has shown us that there's a validity to this, um, all the worldly contact in some way. If, if we felt we needed that, maybe our personal anecdotal experience has shown us that. And then, Furthermore, we see that that's not all sweetness and light. There are a percentage of people who have very negative experiences with. So there seems to be whatever's going on over there, it seems to be a spectrum of good and bad. Um, so I've interviewed um, the psychotherapist, Jerry Mazinski, on my show, who, who worked with people um, in, both in a mental institution and in prisons, uh, suffering with what I was called schizophrenia, this hearing of tormenting voices continuously, encouraging them to do negative, violent things, running them down the whole time. And he became firmly convinced this was all the worldly spirit contact coming through. Irrespective of that, he derived a method which helped people from viewing it that way. Okay, but if we go with that, then it's the question of what effect has that world had on this historically becomes one we just can't not ask anymore. Okay, like we because we, we tend to look at it at individual levels, both good and bad. Like people might have mediumistic contact with family members, or people might be tormented by something they consider to be a hungry ghost or a demonic entity. But it's surely not just then on an individual level. What what if if we acknowledge the existence of this realm, it becomes inevitable that it's having a, a global effect, doesn't it? That, that's the way I'd look at it. Absolutely. And when I heard you say that on the show, it was like an aha moment of like, of course, of course. And, and why aren't more people going there? And I understand it, you know, I understand we get into near death experience, for example, and we're gonna kind of plow through all the, first we're gonna look at the science, you know, and is it real? Is it the last gasp of a dying brain? And we're gonna beat down all the skeptics and all that. And then we're gonna take such pride and wrap ourselves around the data that we have. It is real, my God, you know, you do. So the travel of consciousness is real. And then you're gonna dive into the accounts and you're gonna look at all the accounts and say, wow, you know, isn't this awesome and life transforming and spiritually transformative experience and how you're changed and all that stuff, which is awesome. But then when you're going to take a step back and you're going to say, 
what does this now mean in terms of the larger implications for extended consciousness? And you arrive at the kind of questions that you just asked. Well, if there are these other forces, and they are both malevolent and benevolent, what for, how are they impacting the rest of the world that I live, I live in, beyond me, beyond my family, beyond my mother who I connected with in a medium reading? How are they connecting with these people who perpetrated 9-11? Why? I, I, that's a question that, that I think is a way that you connect these things that we need so much more of, because I don't know who else is, is stepping into that void. Well, I see it historically, like you've had, um, I think his name is Jason Horsley on the show, and he talked about his research, and I've, I've read other people saying the same thing about um, John Dee is considered the intellectual architect of the British Empire. He had the idea of this maritime empire, and he got it um, out of scrying sessions where some spirit being claiming to be the Arch Archangel Michael came through and gave him the whole idea for this. So the British Empire, I suppose you could say, morphed into the Anglo-American Empire. So you have the, the dominant power structure of the past 300 years uh, came through a spirit being claiming to be the Archangel Michael. Now, how do you write that into your history books, you know? Well, and, and then take that one step further, because this is the kind of deep dive stuff that we got to do, because you're talking about uh, hungry ghosts, and you're talking about uh, deception in that realm, which is really where we have to go, and we have to start pulling that apart. And that experience of John D has all the earmarks of deception. So, like you had a great interview with uh, Claire Broad, who I just mm. interviewed recently as well, and my interview isn't up, but you guys did a great, great job in that interview. And one of the things that you asked Claire is, hey, I have a number of people who are worried about, you know, encountering evil entities, malevolent entities in this other realm. And she was very, I think she's awesome person. I really, really appreciate her. And I think she's being totally upfront when she says, look, I don't encounter that. I've been doing this for 22 years. It does not come up. And the couple times it does come up, I don't go there and it goes away. I get that from my own spiritual understanding. I get the secret of the ascent is to always look up, that you can always choose light over dark. And I get that on a as above, so below level in terms of you, if you want to go looking for darkness, you don't need to enter the spiritual realm. You can just drive around your neighborhood and you'll find plenty of darkness and you'll find plenty of people who are doing horribly evil things. So I get that on both of those levels. What I, I don't fully understand is how we connect that with the deep impact that, that these beings seem to be having on our governments, on our, there's no other way to put it. I mean, our, our, it's hard to see back to 9-11. It, it's hard to see that other than evil on so many levels and not evil in terms of, I mean, evil are evil. The United States are evil. If we it pulled in other people's, Mossad's evil, is Israel's evil, Saudi Arabia's evil, so be it. But there's a lot of, there's enough to go around there. Where's the light in that? I'll just return to the point you made earlier that there's, is if you're crossing the line into acknowledging the reality of this realm, whatever it is, it becomes an inevitability, right? That it's having this massive effect on the world that we're not acknowledging. Um, as to what I think of it, I want to proceed cautiously because I feel around the kind of thing we've done with um, the CIA and Alex Asian and Islamic hijackers, we've stepped very cautiously, step by step, proving everything along the way to have something that's very solid, okay? And whilst I might take leaps in speculative conversations, I want to take my time and proceed very cautiously in this kind of area too. And I, I yeah. wonder about that, Richard. And that's one thing I plan on doing differently as I move forward is a lot more leaps because you're there. But I interview so many people that need to be pushed into that leap. Yeah. So um, I certainly agree with, you know, 
placing our attention on, on that area and, and taking leaps and such. However, what I, what I also see, and this is not a factor in Skeptico, right? But I do see out there that there can be, people, people take a lot of leaps in the conspiracy world into very unsubstantiated information, okay? And I think certain traps are set for people, right? There's two ways you can shut down um, a solid investigation into state violence. One is to be dismissive of it and say, you're a bunch of fools, you're exaggerating, you're fantasists, you're conspiracy theorists. And the other is to say, yeah, and not only that, but the planes were holograms and they were being directed by energy weapons from outer space. Now, whilst I can't, you know, prove the planes weren't holograms and so on, um, grossly exaggerated claims are a way of covering things up. So conspiracy theory can become a part of the official cover-up, and that's all I mean by not is, taking leave. I would go one step further. Is yeah. always, is always a tactic as part of the cover-up. So I look at, you know, what's going on today. I, I, I tell you one that, that I have a hunch, kind of from another angle, the whole uh, flat earth thing. Absolutely. The, tra the traction Absolutely. that it got. Uh, yeah, what, what, do you, what are your things? My hunch is that that was fed, watered, and, and nurtured along as a way of kind of pointing at something and going, yeah. look at how I mean, stupid people are to believe that. Well, both of those things, actually. I was a bit ahead of the curve, if you'll pardon my expression, on flat earth. Because years ago, I had a, a bit of philosophy of science course. And my teacher, he always wanted to base like the whole year's course around the flat earth, right? And this is, this is when there were like 10 legitimate flat earthers in the world, okay? So um, I'm assuming he's delighted by the recent turn of events. I, on the other hand, um, did not want to do that because I felt there are so many real controversies in the world like the things that science takes absolutely for granted, which I don't think should be, that flat earth is not worth my time. And I like continue with that. So I think two things. One, I, I hope to live long enough to see the CIA documents declassified and go, they did see the flat earth story onto YouTube. Okay, there was, I, I, and of course, of course, I suspect that it's been helped along, of course. Um, and the second thought, again, I'm just, just parroting what, what you said, Alex. It's an interesting sociological phenomenon of that breakdown of trust because i remember myself if i make the admission i was um i was not a flat earther but i certainly questioned things when i was 10 right because i was very interested in science and i remember like holding a, a ball up and imagining ants walking around it in my school class and thinking like yeah but why don't people in the southern hemisphere fall off right because there's this natural impulse to move down with this and there and then you know i found out about gravity and newton and oh okay that's it so i think um, if, if I was to take something positive from this, it seems like maybe on a societal level, um, society is going through that kind of, hang on, I, I trust so little of what you say now. I don't even believe you've got the shape of the earth right, okay? And I can take a positive from it in that way, in that I, I imagine um, a lot of people who were flat earthers two or three years ago, um, or are now, uh, will not be now or will not be in five years' time. I wouldn't be surprised at all if some of them go on to do very interesting things in other areas. And this is like, the foundational thing for them and in, indeed um one thing i learned from spending time on your forum i'm not going to get the term right but there were two gentlemen on there talking about how there's a way of inquiry that uh, where you start off by going to the most extreme proposition and then working your way into the center i, I can't recall that i keep meaning to go back on through through the skeptical forums and find the term because that was a new one to me but i i, I think that's that it's something that i've unconsciously adopted and maybe what i see people adopting now with with the flat earth Interesting. Interesting. Well, um, let's return to the non-dual thing Yep. And, and explaining what that is, what's been your experience with it. And if it is, I don't know, want to say an alternative to, but it, it does seem to be from my own experience with it and it being part of my spiritual path, being somewhat of an answer to the questions that we were raising in terms of the hungry ghost, uh, the malevolent forces that are so dominant in our uh, political lives and in our, our, our society. Yeah, well, I think it's, a, it's an answer to everything but the detail, okay? So it's a way we can navigate our way through all these subjects 
um, without necessarily knowing are the hungry ghost aliens or are aliens hungry ghosts and, and some of the detail like that it doesn't give us but in terms of like if you're being attacked by a hungry ghost how what, what do you do about that then um, we can look there for support in that so well, what would you like Alex? would you like a, a biography from me of my involvement or yeah that'd be that'd be fine well, yeah all... I mean, the biography is probably um one of the more interesting things about me i suppose so i'll, I'll give you that then so it started for me as like a, a reasonably jaded 16 year old who had rejected his religious upbringing in favor of a, a materialist atheism and finding the utter lack of meaning contained within that was starting to weigh ever more heavily okay as i dragged into that position and um uh, i've never heard anyone else um quite have this story but for me it started with uh, going to the pub and drinking some uh, whiskey okay and whatever that did to me okay the next day i would wake up in this kind of absolute other world of just bliss and i would like walk around in the garden feeling the life force in the trees and the grass under my feet struggling to find any description of what had just happened to me but the best I could come up with fitting into a kind of the, the Christian upbringing I, I'd had was like, it felt like I knew that heaven existed and there was, that this world was a small part of something timeless beyond it that we come from and return to. And that sense of knowledge eradicated my uh, sense of panic about um, life, my worrying about the future, my threatening about what I hadn't done and everything was just bliss. And then wore off by the next day and I was back like, well, go outside and start to rub my hand against the tree and think where, where did that amazing sense of how alive this tree was it's completely gone i'm locked in what just happened and um i'd never heard anyone talk about this stuff right i i was thinking i would i remembered some fragments of some poem by blake about eternity in the palm of one's hand and heaven in a wildflower and that sounded kind of similar so maybe but i didn't know as far as i was concerned i could be the only person who'd ever experienced this no, no one was talking about it um and i'll that was a reoccurring thing then, but I knew it was something to do with uh, shifting consciousness, right? So like that's drugs and meditation. You're going to go down one of those routes. And I got into Eastern martial arts and sort of practicing um, meditation. And my initial experience of that was um, very not like what I'd experienced. Like I, I got into Zen because I heard this thing about be in the moment in Zen. I thought, oh yeah, I, I know I never thought about it that way, but I was very in the moment for those, uh, for those times. But it seemed a very cart before horse to me as well. It seemed like if you continue to push yourself into the moment and, you know, quote unquote, gently pull your attention back there continuously, then you'll start to feel really good. And to me, that was mistaking the result for the cause. Okay, because it's like, no, no, something happened deep within me. I'm not quite sure about it. And that allowed me to be very relaxed and present in the moment. It's not that I, this is very arduous and my experience is anything but. Um, but I did get drawn into that. And it, it was um, an experience of being, because I didn't have a better solution. I, I threw my lot into that order. Really. It got sold to me. And that was my experience of being involved in a somewhat cultish mentality then and thinking I was going to attain enlightenment and I was going to make my mind go snap. And I, I did it probably good overall that I had that in my life, that experience of like being an idiot. And, you know, because um, if I can reflect upon it now. Um, but then I, I really, after two or three years, started to question the underpinnings of what I was doing and um, moved away from that into, um, I was very influenced by a writer called Tony Parsons, um, who had sort of acceptance of what is. Um, and then I suppose really through, through meeting Tim um, and exploring his work more, um, this sense of finding a return to that place and opening up non-dual states, but doing it the way that was more obvious to me of delving into this deeper inner sense of consciousness that's very connected or perhaps the same as the sleep state, but going there consciously and that then changing the world outwards and, and, and refinding that place very like T.S. Eliot, we shall, um, the end of all our traveling, we shall arrive back at the place from where we started and know it for the first time. That was what, what struck me over about a 10 year period of like refinding that 16 year old experience. And I, I take it from understanding your biography deeper, not an easy path, not a path without bumps and doubts and all the other things. Well, the, the big one was there was a period of um, depression when I, I, things were generally on the up for me until I got to about 23. Life was better, my social contacts were better. So I thought, you know, so we'll, we'll go in the right direction. 
and then this um, this overwhelming sense of depression engulfed me, which was a big surprise, right? Because it was not uh, not what I expected, not the way things had been going, and and not the way things are drawn up on the path that you were supposedly on. And yeah, I mean, uh, I can't remember if I was. I, I think I was shocked. I think because I, I thought if I encountered something like that, it would maybe last a day or two, and then I'd you know get myself out of it. I mean, I was aware of. John of the Cross and Dark Knight of the Soul and that kind of thing, but I don't know how much I really related to it. And it went on for so long, I felt like, oh, maybe this is it for me. Maybe it's you know time to start taking the lithium and making the best of it. Uh, I didn't really think about that. I felt about how to you know maybe I should start thinking of how to live with this rather than than get over it. Um, but to to give a sort of esoteric analysis of that, what was going on for me it was a, it was a transition between from belief to the real okay so what i found i'd done was i bought into a lot of concepts like oh the love of god and, and so on and and believed in that and done my meditations with great aspiration that i would come into contact with such a feeling and after a certain time period having to recognize well yeah but it's not really real for me something i believe in but i've never felt the love of god right all the love i felt comes from other people and that's transient it's here one minute gone the next and this sense of what I find inside myself when I look into my depths is a sense of, of emptiness. It's, I used to call it the not nothing because it wasn't even nothingness. It was just an absence, an absolute absence of meaning anything. And when I would meditate, that's what I'd find. And that, that horrified me. And not just in an intellectual way. It was a deep embodied sense of horror that that's what was underpinning all things. Absolute absence of meaning. And um, I had... I eventually encountered the writing of someone who'd gone through a similar experience. And I, I feel what I'd lacked until that point was the tenacity to just stay on the edge of that inner blackness for long enough. And in reading uh, this account, um, I resolved to do just that. And I sat up into the night um, on the edge of despair until it got really late. Well, I better go to bed, but I will be resuming this tomorrow morning. And this is what I'll be doing forevermore now. And I would often wake up for a fit of despair at about 4 a.m. Um, I, I seemed to sweat a lot when you were depressed. I had very sweaty sheets at that time. So I woke up from my usual fit of despair and I saw everyone I knew and who had some meaning in my life like stood around me uh, in this very vivid, dreaming, wake-like state. And they all started shooting off into the distance and everyone represented a little supply of love that was coming into me that was now gone until it got down to one person who had been like... Uh, a very kind to me, a very good friend, uh, it was like a big sister kind of thing. And then she went, and I just had this moment of complete aloneness, and then this oceanic, infinite sense of love opened up. Okay, it was just like bigger than the universe. And it was this classical Advaita non-dual experience of we are swimming in an ocean of love. And I saw all these people in that. I saw people I had problems with, and I felt apologetic that I'd ever needed them to be a certain way because I was this and we were all this and um, much like people say with the near-death experience thing that um, PM Atwater would say say that the the proof of the pudding is in the lasting effects saying I woke up the next morning and my depression was gone right and I didn't know that it was gone for a while like like a couple of weeks went by I was like is it, is it not coming back and uh, I really knew when I went out and got drunk and it would, it would always really hit me if I was drunk and I, I got drunk with a friend and um, wasn't there at all and, and, and never did, never, never resurfaced. So that was, uh, and then my subsequent investigations of non-duality were like, what was that and how do I, I I've sort of fallen <laughs> into, this, into this state through a lot of intensity and a lot of suffering, but um, let, let's try and understand that a bit more properly. Awesome. Just totally awesome stuff. Two questions, I guess. What have you discovered since then? What are some of the most meaningful discussions? I know you still are interested in trauma and in grief and in people who are overcoming. Um, and I think you feel a, a need to support people in that wonderful way. But I can't help but tying this back to the earlier part of our conversation, why is still there that need to understand it in terms of our world, like 9-11? Because the, the world is a reflection of consciousness, I think. It's, it's like a dream, okay? So then on a collective level, we dream 9-11 in some way. And what's the, the... But let me offer a, a counter hypothesis that you'll hear yeah. on the non-dual path, and I've shared it on this show. It's the Ama the Hugging Saint, world what world? You know, so Ama is this 
woman who at 13 had this amazing spiritually transformative experience in India. She was incredibly impoverished, but she knew she just had to devote her life to God. And she has, and she goes around and she supposedly does all these wonderful things with people and works tirelessly 18 hours a day, just helping people, helping people, helping people. And one of her devotees goes to her and says, Amma, you're so busy. You're doing all this stuff for the world. And yet you're telling us we're not of this world. And that's what we hear from spiritual masters all the time, which would, this is not, this is not skeptical because I'm in the world, right? I'm interested in this stuff. I'm interested in 9-11 and why science is wrong about almost everything and all these other things. But there is a part of me that says, I'm doing that as a way of just kind of occupying myself because I really know that on a deeper, deeper sense, it really doesn't matter. Like in the same way that, you know, some of the near-death experiencers you've had come on and said that and said it on my show too, is that this is all just middle stuff. It doesn't cause me a problem where I don't feel there's a contradiction. Now, if you have some sort of psychological issue where in watching a film at the cinema, you started to believe it was real. Okay. You would really want to stop that. Right. Um, so if you're having that kind of issue of not knowing it's an illusion, you need to solve that first. You need to get your mind out and say, yeah, it's okay. I'm in the cinema. It's fine. It's all good. Let's enjoy the show. And that's what I feel about the world we're in. I, I don't necessarily think it's immensely important um, on, on a grander scheme of things, but this is the dream I'm having. This is the art I'm observing. So I want to fully engage with it. And indeed, I think the non-dual allows ultimately for deeper engagement because Again, if you think the film is real, you're just going to want to run or you're going to scream or something. It doesn't allow you to really involve yourself. It's only when you know it's not real, if you have a sense the world isn't real and that where we're ultimately safe, that the deepest part of us isn't in the world, then there's the freedom to engage fully. Love that answer. I agree. I didn't see that coming, but you're right. Okay, you pick next. I've kind of monopolized the board. Um, I'm going to stay away from... E.T. Well, I wonder why suicide is there. I thought you did an excellent did. show, really Suicide and Near-Death Experience with Angie Fenimore. Thumbnail sketch of her story. It's fascinating, you know, sexually abused, traumatic, yeah, sure. high, buries it all, gets to a point, contemplates suicide, attempts suicide, has an NDE, some people would call it a hellish NDE or traumatic NDE, but she says, no, this is a turning point in my life and, you know, all these things. And she comes out of it with a mission to tell others that suicide just can't possibly be an answer because it's just an intermediary step. You know, it doesn't get you anywhere. So um, Angie Fenimore wrote a book back in the 90s called Beyond the Darkness, and it was a, the story of her life which had a lot of trauma in it from childhood on up and then dealing with the effects of that trauma in uh, throughout her adult life then her relationships and such so all of this ultimately led to a serious suicide attempt um and she says she she didn't attempt it she actually succeeded actually she did cross over that line into being dead uh, through taking a lot of medication um inspired somewhat by um near-death experience she's had i feel i just trying to pull this on my memory it was her stepmother who had made suicide attempt and talked about this beautiful sense of love and light on the other side and i think she'd come into contact with some other literature around it and felt like that's the ultimate escape from the trauma of the world is to go off into this this place of of love and light then um and that's not what she encountered she encountered a sense of uh, stepping out of her body, but the problems all still being there because she was still the same. And then a sense of other people being around her who had just done a similar thing and going to this place where people were very, very lost, felt like they'd been there a long time, just drawn into their own suffering, consumed by it, and realizing that this hadn't solved anything. Then calling upon the light and having a sense of God and Jesus coming and an interaction with them then and this sense people talk about it being more real than the waking world and ultimately waking up with a sense of um 
a, a new sense of purpose and a new sense of spirituality. And, and I don't think everything has been sweetness and light since then for her. But for me, the book was, I found it very powerful in the sense of like, I, I might've had a certain ideation around suicide. I don't think I was ever like close to acting it out. Um, but in, in this sense of wanting to escape the trials of the world and it sort of reshaped that in my mind. So I saw the potential for it to reshape that for other people. Then it's, it's not without um, its problems. Um, and, and, and let me just interject a couple of parts that I found particularly meaningful because first, this idea of uh, contemplating suicide at one point or another is probably, I don't know what the stats are. I'm sure it's in the majority of the population. We just don't talk about it. We yeah, just don't talk about thing. that yeah. darkness that it comes in the middle of the night for everyone, no matter who you are, and unless you're kind of totally stuffing it down. And then it comes up in other places when you're down there eating ice cream at two o'clock yeah. in the morning to not think about it, you know. But what I found interesting about her story is, and again, it's like you, you back to I love your thing about the movie, because here's some reality that we have to pack back in. So part of the reality is she's faced with contemplating suicide and she's shown, instructed, told by this higher being that you should not do this because look what it will do to your children. It will do this. It will do this. It will, you will lose out this. Now, it says so much about, one, it says this about there are lessons that we have to learn and whether we learn them on this level or whether we learn them through help from these spirits, whatever that means, that that's somehow part of it. It also raises this question of, can we change this timeline that we're on? Uh, it's long been a question of mine that I don't think is fully answered in the near-death experience where you hear people say, this is your time, this is not your time, or you hear people say, hey, this is your time, and they go, no, 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 this is not my time, and then they're allowed to go back. There's a, a, a million questions that aren't, completely, that aren't completely answered by your interview with Angie, but are, are at least teed up. Yeah, sure. Um, I think with the, the suicide thing, you know, if, there is this absolute stigma around acknowledging any ideation of it whatsoever, and it's not something anyone would want to do. Um, when I've talked to people about this, more and more people will acknowledge that they have the thought, right? And that they can be a million miles away from doing it. But I think it's, it's to our detriment that we pathologize thinking about it, right? With any kind of relationship you have, the, the, if it's healthy, there's the possibility to end it, whether it's a job, a partner, anything. And we, in a sense, have a relationship with life, okay? And I think the, the impulse to say, oh, I've just had enough of this, right? I want out. Well, I'm not saying that's the way to go, but it's going to tell you a lot about yourself if rather than being afraid of that sense of I want out, you think, okay, why is that? What is it that I can't cope with in this moment? So we, we demonize the impulse to our detriment, I think. And I wanted to engage with Angie um, on that level. I was also interested to ask her, she wrote this book back in the 90s, okay? And there's been so much done since then on the death experience. So how her interpretation has um, maybe changed since then, okay? So for example, Angie's Christian, and she had a very Christian experience, okay? But since then, she's read a lot about this experience. She's read even Alexander and, and all sorts. And um, she, so I asked her, do you feel that you met Jesus because he's the correct one? He's the one true God, or because he's a symbol of some deeper infinite consciousness? And, and she doesn't have an answer to that as, you know, we don't, but she says that it's, it's come through more to her since than that, um, you know, maybe it's this, this deep, infinite mind love thing that's expressing itself in the right way. We can't be definite about that. So on, on the details of it, but that's, um, yeah. And there's something, I, again, I don't, for me also, it doesn't answer all, all the things. Like Angie's experience is, it has this very dualistic quality to her. Like she was in the darkness and God was light and he came to the edge of the darkness because he couldn't go into the light. And he told her, you know, she made a mistake in doing this and he brought her back to life. So there, there's a, a dualism that's maintained between that, right? Like suicide is a bad thing and you keep it away. Um, and I think there's different ways of, of seeing it there too, in terms, as I've been mentioning, this idea of integration of like, what is the, what is the impulse, the desire to end it, uh, have to tell me. So that, that those are the things that came out. Ultimately, I wanted to create something that uh, would be valuable 
to people as a resource in um, who may be struggling with those kind of feelings. And, and this is the counterintuitive part, um, helpful to people who might have had a loved one go through suicide. Okay, because that's, I say counterintuitive because this, this, this dark place that they, um, Angie talks about going to is not necessarily what people would want to hear, but I don't think people want fluffy stories about light and love in that sense. And what Angie came back with was the sense of, she certainly didn't feel that it was only her that got saved and everyone else is, is, is screwed, right? There was a sense of being able to connect through love, through thought forms, through prayer, as previous guests on Skeptical have talked about, um, with, with people on the other side who maybe there is a continuation of suffering and struggle. Okay? Maybe not for everyone. But for some people, maybe that's the case. But what, we, what Angie doesn't leave us with is this sense of that's an infinite divide then, uh, this kind of religious, um, we, we get it from Christianity a lot, that when, when you're lost, you're lost forever. Great. So there's two more that I want to make sure we get to. I'll let you pick the order, but the cultish and the ET. And I know you're begging off the ET, but we have to go there a little bit. Which one would you like to go to? Now? We'll do ET at the end, then we'll do cultish. Now, what about cultish? So, another really interesting interview that you did. Oh, yes. yes. Holy hell. Tell folks a little bit about this. And then I want to talk more broadly about what's going on with cults and how it taps into a lot of the stuff that we're talking about in a really interesting way. So, please jump in at any, at any part you want. So Holy Hell is a documentary. If you have Netflix, you can see it. And it's a cult documentary, okay? And I sat down and watched it one evening. And, and for the first 20 or 30 minutes, you might think, oh, you know, this doesn't look too bad. I don't, I don't know what the, what's going to be the, the dark side here. It all looks like having a lovely time. And then it just goes off a cliff and descends into insanity and people's lives being ruined, people being sexually abused by their, their guru, um, just awful traumatic experience for the people involved. And I interviewed um, Chris Johnson, one of the participants in the interview. I was just thinking about this the other day, actually. It's probably one of the most interesting hours of my life was, was speaking to Chris and getting his insights about how he, as a, a, a young man who was not lacking in streetwise and had been approached by religious groups on the streets of, I think it might have been L.A., um, the Moonies or whatever had um, laughed and said, oh, this is ridiculous. It's the cult. So he knew what a cult was, but then still got involved in, in a cult and ended up doing- For like 20 things. years. For 20, yeah, about that, yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the guru figure, I, I've, he went by various names and I've forgotten all of them, um, to, to be honest. But um, it, yeah, getting his insights on that, how he, um, questions I was left with were, was he genuinely interested in, in spirituality and it kind of got a bit e egotistical or was it just a scam for him and, and, and these kind of things? And do, did Chris feel like there were psychological factors in him that drew him to that or was it just, you know, anyone could have fallen for the, the con job? Um, and so on. So yeah, Alex, go, just where, where do you want to go with that kind of, that whole thing there? Well, you don't, because you have this interest in uh, spirituality and in exploring these deep states, one of the questions I wanted to ask you in particular is, when you're watching this movie, this excellent, brave, brave documentary for, for not only Chris to kind of come out and say, this guy, you know, coerced me into having sex, but then, and I think Chris is gay, right? I'm not really sure, to be honest, what, how, we, how we would define that. Because the reason I bring that up is, you know, even more sadly, in, in a very confusing way, there's other young men who are heterosexual, who are coerced or, you know, whatever you want to say, into having sexual relations with this guru who just has this power over them, is doing therapy with them, is doing hypno hypnosis with them. And they wind up having these, you know, sexual encounters with them. And again, I, I you know, I have to, I hate to even have to say there's nothing wrong with being gay. Of course, there's nothing wrong with being gay. But you, the trauma in these people's lives say that's not my sexual orientation. And I look back at that with this 
incredible shame mm-hmm. because, mm-hmm. you know, how did I wind up in that situation? So there's these people who come on the film that are incredibly brave and they reveal this story, which, as you say, it, it is not typical, but then is typical of what we see in cults. But I digress, Richard, and that's why this show goes on without a lot of questions. The part I found particularly interesting is the Samadhi experiences that these people have. So when you talked about your experience with the whiskey and the all feeling of love, there are certain people on this planet that seem to be able to transmit that experience to other people through a touch through a gaze, through any various number of waves. And these people have been reported through history and they a lot of times sit up on a cushion up on the stage and people throw flowers and money at them because we have such unbelievable uh, respect. But more to the point, the participants have this, if you have that incredible feeling, the most profound feeling of your life, like you talked about that next morning after drinking the whiskey, man, it's hard not to be attached to that. And it's hard not to attach yourself to the person who you think transmitted that experience. So there's so much to pull apart there. What do we think is going on when someone like this, who is not a good person by any measure, seems to be able to affect this inside of people? Yeah, so I don't have a final answer on this one, but it's something I've explored and journeyed on myself. So I I think for one, there's definitely a sense in watching the film of, but for the grace of God, there go I. There was a period in my life where I can see definitely I could have taken that course. If I'd have met the wrong people at the right time, yes, I I could have fallen into that, you know? Um, At the same time, I do feel that getting involved in spirituality in the early noughties, the first time I ever heard about Sai Baba was when I heard about the accusations of pedophilia, right? So the 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 veneer was falling off the gurus, the, the gloss was falling away. So then okay, we the start we start out with this idea that there are some people who go into consciousness in such a profound way that they can wave their hand above your head and that will induce this immense experience of you because they are so enlightened and pure in themselves. Okay. That's that's the starting place of this. And then then the accusation surface that these people are not holier than thou. They're doing stuff that's, in some cases, not only uh, dark, but so dark it would make them amongst the most evil 1% of people in the population. So then we have to move that and say, okay, well, well, people can be enlightened on a very deep level of consciousness um, and, and touch the infinite and transmit that. But in the middle, it doesn't necessarily purify their psyche and they can have all these demons of in. So this power comes through, uh, but you shouldn't necessarily trust them. And um, that's, that's a model um, Tim Freak moved towards. And that's why I'm sort of picking this up from. I, I mentioned his name because um, he came up with this great analogy of like, look, it's like a rock star, okay? Like you, you, you might, no one expects rock stars to be good people. In fact, you know, if they were good people, that would probably be a letdown. If they, you went backstage and they were just drinking herbal tea and they weren't like snorting cocaine or something, you'd be a bit disappointed. So, uh, but they have a genius. There's a genius in them for music. And artists are tormented people. And actually we should move gurus out of the spiritually pure category and put them in the tormented genius category. Awesome. I'll tell you what, I, I love that. And I think it also speaks to your earlier point about understanding the movie is the movie. I mean, I have a friend who is a devotee of Sogyal Rinpoche, the um, recently deceased Buddhist. And, you know, he really struggles because he knows full well. He's a nasty, abusive guy who, you know, had sex with all his young female devotees. But he struggles with that he can't ignore that the most profoundly shifting moments of his life came in the presence of this man or in his group. And he's had to, you know, wrestle with that. And it's different. I think it gets right into our attachment patterns and disorders and probably how we were parented and what we're unconsciously searching for in that level. So I understand why people get a real lock in to that. And whilst I agree it's part of the movie and the the process then is to recognize why we're being drawn to this other person, what they give us in the way we are, and to come into our own sense of oneness. Um, I sympathize with that being a difficult journey and one that can take time. Totally agree. Okay, Richard, why have you been avoiding E.T.? E.T.'s right on your shoulder, man. 
E-T, you are E.T. Isn't that what we found out? At the end of the day, isn't that the real reality here that we are E.T.? Is it? I um, I blame Skeptico for this. I was just trying to do some basic meat and potato near-death experience research, and then I stumbled across Mary Rodwell's interview that you conducted, and that, that, was, that was the rabbit hole I never wanted to fall down, but then I was down it, and... I was like, oh, Simon Small. Yeah, that was another, um, again, entirely by accident. Simon is um, a priest in the Church of England. He's retired now, a deeply mystical, contemplative man um, in that that aspect of the church, and I I really wanted to interview him um, on that. And he wrote a sci-fi book, big fan of sci-fi, so he wrote a book about a priest who meets aliens, um, bringing those two worlds together. I didn't really know his his interest in this whole area was was prompted by some personal experience of contact. Okay, so that that came up in sci-fi interview, and then of course you've got to go there. So we did an alien encounters, um, an alien encounters interview. So to to me, what I thought would be kind of interesting to talk about and just drag you into the deep water here <laughs> is that. It's like stepping stones across the river. And I guess my earlier rant about, I do want to jump, I do want to launch into kind of conclusions. And that's not maybe exactly what I meant. But what I do feel like I want to do is I don't want to not recognize when the burden of proof kind of thing shifts in a dramatic way and that we have to change our belief system in a way that says, well, I now have to accept that until I'm proven otherwise. Here are the stepping stones to me. I always like bringing up the New York Times, Fox News, CBS News, December 2017, is it? Yeah. Mm, I think so, yeah. You know, I mean, it's outed. So the DOD has now come out and said, our government in the United States has said, yeah, they're here, they're UFOs. So the stepping stone for me is, number one, you lied your ass off about that for at least 60, 70 years. You threatened people. You threatened to kill people, kill their families, kill everyone if they revealed this UFO secret. And now you just kind of casually kind of slip it out there in a little uh, you know, oh, it would never was really classified information anyway. Here's the video. You can see for it yourself. What surprises me in that is that people seem unexplainably reluctant to take the next step. If we see the UFO video that the DOD now has thrown the holy water on and say, yep, that's real, that's real, then certainly ET is real. There's someone piloting those crafts and it's E.T. And then how would we not connect that to the ancient alien hypothesis, which I think is overwhelmingly just self-evident when you go and you interview, like I interviewed uh, Artie Sixkiller Clark, who is a Native American uh, anthropologist at Montana State, who goes and interviews all these uh, indigenous people in North America and Canada, the United States and South America. And they say, oh yes, this is our tradition. The star people came and they gave us all this and we are in fact the star people. And then you go over to Africa and you talk to the Dogon and they say, yes, the star people, they came for this. And then you go and you look at Egypt and you look at the lining of the pyramids and of course they're with the stars and it's the star people. I mean, it, again, if, if the pivot point is the DOD release of the videos and saying, yeah, this is real. Well, then there, there does have to be this kind of avalanche here of accepting all these other things. So the Mary Rodwell interview that you mentioned that I did, and we can juxtapose that to the interview you, did, you just referenced that you did, brings us face to face with the hybridization of us the hybridization of ETs, this genetic transformation from all these different species that might be out there in the universe to something that is us right now, but is in the process of constantly being tweaked and changed. That to me 
I'm not going to say that's certain. I'm just saying that until that can be thoroughly disproven, that has to become the most likely scenario, in my opinion. And then the larger question that I get to in all this, back to your whole, this whole interview is, does that change anything about all these conversations we were having about deep spirituality? Does it change it at all? Or is it just fit right into it seamlessly? So there's a ton on the table there, but go ahead. Yeah, I could see it not changing anything about deep spirituality. If you take this non-dual idealist paradigm that the fell into that big ocean of love and presumably the UFOs are arising in that too, whatever they are. So, um, you know, unless I've fundamentally misinterpreted my experience there, which is of course always a, a possibility, um, I could see it not changing that. And this, this being like another aspect of, of the world we inhabit. Um, I think- Can we explore that for a minute? How does that work? It uh, sounds self-evident to me. So what, can you elaborate on the question a bit? In one way, I get that it's self-evident. In another way, uh, how come Angie isn't all over that? How come she isn't coming back and that's the first thing she says? The variety of the manifestation of that one love consciousness is infinite. There's like millions and millions of different uh, manifestations of it. She doesn't say that. Yeah. Well, no, but I mean, think of the context here that Angie is not going into the, she, you know, she's not taking tablets to shut her heart down because she wants to have this deep conscious experience because she's a psychonautical explorer. She's doing it in an act of utter desperation. So it feels like what, what reaches out to her is the appropriate image for this lady born into Christian spirituality. And that's been the thing she's clung to for her life for soulful substance. So uh, it makes sense to me in that way. It make, you know, whereas by contrast, someone in a Rick Straussman group taking DMT so they can explore the depth and breadth of the universe might have a different experience that that speaks more to that. So, um, hold, on, hold on, let's let's pause on that because like this is like really the conversation that I wanted to have. So, mm -hmm. does that really wash though? Because one of Angie's uh, uh, concerns is she's hearing the voice of God and she wants to make sure she gets it down just right which always strikes me as a little bit strange, although I love what Angie has to say and what she brings forward is phenomenal. She's, a, she's gifted in terms of her, her, her knowledge and her understanding of it, but I wanted to make sure I got the voice of God just right. Mm, do you really think you got, you know, like if it's God talking to you, then why are you just getting that little sliver? And then when we jump over, and I just interviewed Deborah Diamond, who I think is a really great medium and she's talked to you know thousands and thousands of spirits and see spirits all the time and i ask her and she's like well no i'm not sure i'm down with reincarnation I'm like, mm -hmm. what do you mean you're not down with reincarnation i already proved it over at the university of virginia and then if you want to talk about aliens it's like a whole different kind it's like whoa i don't know anything about that i mean it it doesn't it doesn't fit together in a way that i would expect it to if the whole ET genetic we are ET kind of story is real I would expect to see that pop up more um yeah I, mean, I, I can only address the Andy thing by being a bit sort of theological and, and making statements like God reaches out to us in the form we can accept right and then that fundamentally makes sense to me okay because if I'm having a conversation like this and we're, we're exploring the nature of reality I, I'm not sat here thinking what's the most compassionate and kind way to speak to Alex that won't upset his apple cart, you know? But if, I, if I'm, you know, interacting with someone who's maybe the big thing for them is they're suffering and struggling and they have a particular religious view, um, that, that does come into play then. And I'm, I'm happy to fit into whatever language bracket people feel comfortable if I can, you know, be of some service in that way. So it, it makes sense to me to, you know, extrapolate from if that's the way I would act, then, you know, it, it makes sense that that, that carries on up so that when whatever deeper being interacts with Angie in her moment of suffering, it makes sense it would reach her in, in that in that form because um, compassion trumps exploration in that moment. God is working on a need to know basis. Yeah, I think, well, that is, I, yeah, I can't say it's right, it makes sense to me. It's also not lost on me, Alex, that, okay, I, 
when I was 23, 24, I was really into Neo Advaita. I looked at the world that way, or Advaita Vedanta. And what do you know? My experience was a very non-dual classical Advaita Vedanta experience. Oh, what a coincidence. I guess that's the right one then. Okay, <laughs> well, maybe. There's something very pure, very uh, non-mythological about the way I experienced it. Okay, I didn't meet Jesus or something. Um, but also, maybe uh, that's just, you know, I'm seeing the part or feeling the part of the elephant that I can feel in that. And I might have my own cognitive restrictions because of the lens I've, I've picked up, you know. I don't doubt that if I'd been um, very much done this soul searching through a more Christian lens, I would be speaking a, a different language in, in reporting it. Maybe not, you know, maybe the same experience or maybe the experience would be a little different. I don't know. But R Related question as we start to wrap this up. Are we looking at two ladders that are leaning up against different walls? One ladder being the spiritual ladder that you're talking about, and we're uh, trying to ascend, hopefully, that ladder. And then we have these different experiences, and oh, we could call them non dual, or we could call them Christian, or we could call them mystical or Gnostic, or all these different things. And we get under, we understand all the complexity and challenges of that, and all the rest of that. And then there's this other ladder that we're exploring, which is, you know, what's going on and well, how does science relate to that? And we are a genetic experiment and we are being manipulated, but that our consciousness is manifesting. And they're still talking, now on that ladder, they're still talking about consciousness and they're talking about Rick Strassman and they're talking about the purple jaguar and all the rest of that. But when you really get up to the top of these ladders, you find they're on two completely different walls. And the one wall is looking deeply at this time-space reality. And it's just trying to figure that out and not putting judgment on that, but just saying, here are all the things that we can experience in this time-space reality. And hey, there's these other beings that are, seem to be popping into it and experiencing it with us. And then this hypothesis then, if I were to round it out, would say, this other wall, that as you're ascending it, 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 at the top of it, it becomes more and more separated from the other wall because the other wall doesn't really, it's just like a game. It's just kind of an experience. But at the end of the day, this other true spiritual ascension is what it's all about. Does that analogy make any sense or does it? No, no, I, I, I think so. I mean, I think you could say, okay, it depends on your perspective on things like the UFO phenomena. So, for example, if like David Jacobs has got the correct answer, then the ladders are quite separate. The, the UFOs, the aliens aren't here for any spiritual reason. They've just seen resources and they want to take them. Um, on the other hand, you know, obviously like a, a Mary Rodwell perspective would have the, the two ladders very conjoined. I can't make sense of the questions you ask. I think they're like exactly the right questions to be asking regarding like why does this person say reincarnation and this person says you know only three times and why do some people say spirits want close contact with their families when they're gone and you can do therapy around that and others say no leave them alone they're busy with their own thing. Um, I, I suspect that it might be that our way of understanding the world our rules of logic and such are more limited and we're dealing with something that's just on another level and we can know more you know we're like if the ancient greeks tried to understand um or found the facts we know about the world about having the reasons they wouldn't be able to understand quantum mechanics or something you know it's just they're not in a position where they can even approach that and i suspect we're not in a position where we can approach and move shouldn't try and i appreciate that's the ultimate cop-out answer but that's also just because of the variety of the way the phenomena has come through and how there are all these apparent contradictions it, it makes me think that we would need to look at this on a deeper level in some way that we might have limited access to hey it's either a cop-out or it's the most deep, profound answer. It is the world, what world answer? It is the AMA answer, right? It's like, hey, I'm playing the game as hard as I can, but I still see it as a movie. I don't, I don't forget that. So I think that's just awesome. I hope I can turn this into something that is edutainment for at least some folks out there. It's been awesome to me because as you can tell, I've had a lot of of my own deep state consciousness experiences while listening to your excellent, excellent show. And I, I really hope people check it out. You're really in this glut of 
podcasting content, then there's some so much fantastic stuff out of it. I do hope people find their way over to your excellent show. Richard, as we wrap it up, tell folks what you have coming up, what you're working on. Um, okay, well, I've just, I've, I've, my mind is um, fried at the moment because I've, I've spent the past um, month or so working on an interview with a fellow from the FBI about the kind of intelligence failures we're talking about. We have gone into the ring over the collapse of the towers thing with the um, physicist David Chandler. Um, I also have um, lined up uh, a lady who, um, she was a client of Dr. Janet Colley, who worked with UFO encounters, as people having that, and a lady who's had a kind of spiritual awakening through prolonged encounters. Okay, who's, who's writing a book on the subject um, to explore the spirituality of contact. So that's something I'm very much looking forward to. Um, to doing and a continuation of all the themes basically there's, there's all these themes which i i get completely absorbed whenever i'm doing and forget everything else exists and then I'm, oh yeah i did that so there's a continuing thing i'm doing looking at around the spirituality of hell and i've got a tibetan lucid dreamer coming on next to continue that series looking at the spiritual value in hellish experiences awesome much for me to to look forward to great listening for uh good walk on the beach. Richard, it's been absolutely awesome having you on. I know I kind of sprung this on you at the last minute in terms of turning this into a Skeptico episode, but um, I'm glad we did. Uh, so great to- Absolutely, to yeah. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks again to Richard Cox for joining me today on Skeptico. One question I'd have to tee up at the end of this interview, what the heck does 9-11 have to do with deep spirituality? I tried to make the link because to me, it's really so much of what this show is all about. But as always, I'm interested to hear what you have to say, your thoughts, your ideas, the best place to connect with other people who are listening to the show and to connect with me is through the Skeptical Forum, skeptico-forum.com. You can find that through the Skeptical website, S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O.com, where you will find all our previous shows available for free download, mp3, take them, run with them, do what you will with them. Um, I have a number of, I think, super interesting shows coming up, a couple of half-baked projects that I'm super excited to do. I hope you stay with me for that. I hope you join this community in any way that seems to make sense for you and share it with anyone you think needs to hear about it. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <music>